Bible study time now. So if you take your Bibles and uh, turn to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 2. 1 Peter, chapter number 2. And as I mentioned last time, that this particular study has, uh, it started because I did want to uh, really investigate a bit more the conscience and, you know, because so many are struggling with uh, the, the mandates that are being put forward to us and the difficulties sometimes with that, with, uh, you know, how, how do we operate in those matters? And then, um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the vaccinations and uh, don't, don't disregard those as though that isn't something that's a matter of conscience as well, because many times it is a matter of conscience and we just don't know how to articulate the, those things. And you might find yourself right now thinking no big deal, but in another matter thinking it's a big deal. So, you know, here's what I found, as I mentioned, is that as the weeks go by, uh, there's more and more that comes out that, that shows me that, you know, one person draws a line here, and the next person here, and the next person here, and the next person here. Eventually, we all have a line that we draw. And that line is really where our conscience will take us to. And beyond that, we have to violate our conscience. So we're, that's really why this study got started. And uh, it has, I guess, of necessity then grown into uh, a little bit. It's going to be a bit on the role of government and, and uh, what role they play in our lives. And um, I, I've, I've read a lot. I've read a, an awful lot. And I'm trying to get clarity, and I am reading other people. Uh, because I want to, I want to see other voices and what the Lord maybe has shown other people. Uh, I'm reading some fascinating stuff on, on how uh, governments were viewed in different ages. So going back, say to the, to the 1700s or the 1500s even, and then 1700s and 1800s, and and I'm also reading some material now on, uh, on Australian law and how Australian law was uh, interpreted. And uh, it's, it's all very, very interesting. And the reason I'm reading that is because many of these men, as they wrote, they would reference the Scriptures. And if they didn't reference the Scriptures, it's because they had come to the position of saying they didn't believe the Bible or God anyway. For instance, uh, uh, Karl Marx and Joseph Engels, uh, they rejected uh, God. And because of that, then they had a system of, of government and of course their system of government is murderous and, and oppressive and wicked and uh, so I'm just reading through all of that and I want you to know that because I'm really trying my best to have the best take on it and then and filter it through the Word of God so what I give you is helpful to you and I know that n most of us aren't going to land in the same place but if we can at least agree that we're trying to handle it biblically, I think that's a step in the right direction. All right, so we're in 1 Peter chapter number 2, and I'm, I'm sort of marking my time here to be cautious that I don't just go on and on. And uh, before I read anything tonight, let's go ahead and pray one more time. Uh, Father, would you help clear my thoughts, and then would you help, uh, would you help direct my thoughts? And would you help me to say things that are important and necessary and things that are helpful? And uh, the truth is, Lord, there's still areas that I'm just a little bit unsure. And uh, I'm trying my best to understand your Bible. And I pray that you would help us to understand it. And tonight, would you bring clarity on some matters as we look at the matter of conscience? And God, I sure do appreciate how your, your word touches so many areas and how just a simple study like this can grow into more and more as we realize that the Bible speaks to so many areas of our life. It really, our lives are untouched, or, or cannot be untouched, I should say, uh, by your word. Every area is spoken of in some way or form or principle. And so I'm really thankful for it, and I ask that you'd help me tonight now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2 and we're going to be in this passage a couple of times in this study, but I'm going to, instead of handling verses 10 and following, uh, I'm going to start in verse 18. And the reason I'm doing this now is because as it deals with conscience, we're looking at it in different contexts. If you remember, I'm just going to go back and look at my notes to make sure I get everything right, what I want to say here. 
Remember that we started off in 1 Corinthians chapter number 8 and our principle was that we don't use our individual liberty in a way that causes a brother to, in Christ to violate their conscience or if you will sin or transgress against their conscience in following your lead. Okay, And so that was really the main principle that we come away, from, come away with in, in chapter number 8 of 1 Corinthians. I don't want you to follow my lead and violate your conscience and in so doing sin because you're not doing it by faith. And then we looked at uh, chapter number 10 and we saw that the, in chapter number 10 that we're not to allow our liberty to become a matter uh, that causes someone to believe evil or ill of us and that we're to do all things for the glory of God without unnecessary offense to someone, but rather for their profit. And here is, here is the principle of setting aside some liberty that we have for the sake of someone else if it's going to cause them offense. And it's offense in the sense of cause them to stumble in regard to Christ. Not just, you know, there's so many thin-skinned people today. If they say, that offends me, that triggers me, that this, that, that. You, if you're like that, you need to toughen up and get some thicker skin. And shame on you if you, you spend your life trying to get people to kowtow to your own personal offenses. That's, that's ridiculous, and that's not scriptural at all. So if, that's, if, if someone listening to me is like that, you need to get over that and, uh, and, and get real with life. What we're talking about here is that I'm willing to step back from a, a liberty that I may have so that I don't cause you to stumble in Christ. And... And again, your, your application of that may be a little different to mine. But if we're striving to please the Lord in that matter, then, you know, again, the principle is going to hold true no matter how it's applied. So both of those really declare the maturity of the believer. Now, somebody with a weak conscience, remember, you can't be running around trying to get people to, uh, to, to, to simply obey your conscience. That's not how it works. Uh, so we've, we've covered all that, and I don't need to rehash all that territory. Really what we want to do is we want to do what we do to the glory of God. We want to do it uh, so that we don't give offense to a person if we can avoid it. And we're seeking for someone else to profit. And these things are profiting in the things of God. Okay, now 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 18 and 19. Another matter of conscience here. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now I'm going to, uh, I'll pick it up. Uh, no, let's go ahead and read that. Verse 20, For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and you suffer for it you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges, judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. All right, so let's just break this down a little bit. The, the context here is speaking of servants and masters. And uh, it, it means exactly what it says, servants, masters. If you want to apply it to your employer and employee, that's fine, but it, it means exactly what it says. It's servants and masters. There are some masters who are good and are gentle. And of course, everybody wants to be, you know, the servant to someone like that. You can read a lot in history, and, and there were. There were, both on, uh, there were some on both sides of that, some that were good and gentle and some that weren't. Uh, but there are, in fact, masters that are godly people, and they're, they're good to their servants, and they're gentle to their servants, and they practice really what the Old Testament laid out in regard to servants and masters. And, uh, you know, today people are trying to discredit the Bible and make it say things that it doesn't say, and so they'll try to tell you that if you believe the Old, Test Old Testament, then that means that you believe in having slaves. And, and uh, you know, they're trying to get you to think about it in the sense of maybe the, uh, the slavery of the United States or the slavery or the mistreatment of people even in this country. And that is not at all what the Bible was about in the Old Testament. In fact, it, 
it, it, it explicitly restricts that and punishes uh, an, an owner for being that way. So don't let people talk you in a corner about that stuff. But these masters, there's some that are good and gentle, but there are others who are froward. And uh, whether we're talking about masters and servants or whether we're talking about employers or employees, or can I even say this, whether we're talking about governments, the fact is, is that there's some that are good and gentle and there's others that are froward. That is, that they're difficult and they're rough and they don't treat people right. Now, let's set the government thing aside because we're going to come back to that in its true context. But just think about what it says in regard to conscience. The, ser the servant here is said to be subject to them. It doesn't say be subject to them if they're good and gentle only. It says to be subject to them even if they're froward. And, uh, and that's difficult for us. We're raised in a free society, and all of us were raised in an environment where that's just not on. And you know, m mainly our thinking is, we don't have to put up with that. I don't have to deal with that. I don't have to listen to that. I don't have to be treated that way. And, and fundamentally, I would agree with that. But the, the Holy Spirit here is telling us, when you're in a position where you don't have the choice, then there's going to be some that are good and gentle and some that aren't. And what do you do? You, you're subject to them. You're subject to them. Servants, he says in verse 18, be subject to your masters with all fear. Now, we're going to talk about the word subject in a moment, but just to understand that when, sometimes when you're subject doesn't mean that you have to be obedient in all things. And I'll explain that in a little bit. But he does say be subject to them. If a master owns a servant. That's the way it is. And sometimes you have to work through that situation when it's not a nice situation at all. But the purpose for being uh, subject to him is that the thankworthiness, he says in verse number 19. This is thankworthy. And what's thankworthy? Well, when the person who's the servant keeps their conscience clear toward God and endures the grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, simply this, that servant has to become, at that point, the servant of God, whether it's a good master or whether it's a froward master. That servant has got to resign himself that I'm going to serve God in the place where I find myself and I can't change it. I, I, I'm, you know, if I'm a servant, I'm probably purchased. I'm owned by him. And at this point, I can't change that. So what I can do, though, is I can change my attitude and I can change my heart and I can keep my conscience, my knowledge toward God clear and that I, I don't just do it for the sake of doing it, but rather I do it because I want God to be pleased. And if it's a froward master, it makes no difference whether he's pleased or not pleased or she's pleased or not pleased. That's irrelevant in this matter. What matters is that God is pleased with it and that's what's thankworthy. And so the application simply is this, that it's more important that we have a clear conscience toward God than it is for us to be treated good and gently. Now, I, I already know what people are thinking on this, and you're just going to have to let that stand as it is, and, and we'll just work through the passages. And I probably thought what you thought. That's why I know what you're thinking. Because I didn't really like how this all landed, uh, even though I'm finding <clears throat> I'm altering my, dis my opinions a little bit as I read more and more. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm freeborn. And uh, I don't like that. I don't, if somebody's mistreating me, I want to be able to walk away. But you can't always walk away. And when you can't, then it's, it's time to change your heart attitude and simply say, all right, I'm doing this for God. And that's where my thank, my, my thank worthiness is going to come in because my conscience is clear to God. And if they're not treating me good and gently, I can still serve God. Now, if you look at chapter 3, this is expanded, and he takes this even a bit further. So we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. And here he says this, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. That's the same as... Pursuing after it, going after it, and sue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is He that will harm you 
if you be followers of that which is good. All right, verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We often quote that out of its context, but here in its context, look at verse 16. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. All right, so what do we have? We have here now moving beyond just masters and servants to just the general teaching to the church. And it's this, sometimes we have to suffer for righteousness' sake. And that means that we're living according to the Word of God. And, and again, I know that the Word of God is clear, but sometimes the way we understand it, depending on where we're at in our Christian life, it's applied differently by different people. I'm not open, opening Pandora's box that you can do what you want and I can do what I want and they're both right. What I'm saying is that sometimes our understanding of the application of some biblical truths varies from person to person or even church to church. And because of that then, we can, be, uh, we, we can have grace with one another to know that both are trying to serve God for righteousness. And sometimes when we serve God for righteousness' sake, we're going to suffer for it. And, and when we suffer for it, that doesn't automatically then mean that we cut bait and run. Rather, sometimes you have to bear under it. And so as you're serving in a situation, or as you're ministering, as you're suffering, let me say, in a situation that's difficult, he says in verse number 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now notice again, this is this heart matter I keep referring to. We're sanctifying, we're purifying the work of God in our hearts, we're purifying God in our hearts, and you know as well as I do that whatever's in our hearts is what comes out in our life and our words and our actions. So sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And in addition to that, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you uh, with meekness and fear. So somebody comes along and says, why are you suffering for righteousness sake in this situation? Why are you remaining there and, and, and why do you have joy in that? And you say, well, as I'm purifying God in my heart, I can say, well, because I know I'm pleasing God and I have the hope of Him hearing my prayer. I have the hope of Him of delivering me from the situation in His due time, but I also have the hope of Him purifying me through the process. And, and again, I would say that I'm quite guilty of this. You know, I'm like anybody else. I want to be out of trouble, out of the trouble that faces me as quickly as I can be. But brethren, that's just not the way life is. And sometimes when we're suffering, it's not against the will of God. It's because of the will of God. And that's what he said. It's better in verse 17, if the will of God be so that ye suffer, and if it is God's will, if you suffer, make sure you're suffering for things that are righteous and good and not because you're an evildoer. And I'm afraid that many Christians uh, try to take their Christian liberty too far to the place where they're, they're neglecting what we've already learned and they're trying to exercise their rights, which by the way, uh, I'm willing to back off a little bit on that, uh, but only to a degree, because when we're exercising our rights, to the detriment of the gospel or to the detriment of the obedience of the word of God or to the detriment of those that are watching and that no, and they begin to look at us as evildoers rather than doing righteousness, then it's time for me to reassess myself, my life, my actions, my thoughts, my position on a thing and, and find out, am I really in the right place with the Lord? Have I sanctified the Lord God? And am I able to give a reason from the scriptures of why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and that I would be willing to suffer for that, that matter. And so when I look at verse 15 and verse 16 together, let me, let me read those together again. I want to make a statement. 
Sanctify the Lord, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone, every man, pardon me, that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So here's what I want to say in regard to 15 and 16 together. Verse 15, the answer that we give of the hope should match the conscience that we have and the truth. And our conscience cannot be separated from truth as believers. We can't do it. If you're doing that, then your problems are deeper than what we can deal with tonight. I can't separate my conscience from truth. I can't say the truth of the matter that God said is this, but my conscience is this, therefore I'm going to do this. That's not how it works. Conscience is with knowledge. The truth is the truth. It's knowledge. And I've got to educate myself from the Word of God. What does the Bible say in the matter? Once I know what it is, then I'm going to conduct myself in that light, in that vein, and I'm going to uh, sometimes suffer for it. But if I'm going to suffer for it, then praise the Lord. That's the will of God that I suffer that way. But I want to be able to answer everyone to say, hey, my conscience is clear. And the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because of the truth. Because I know what God's Word says. And, and again, you know, we can't always, we're not going to twist it to make it say what I want it to say. It's got to be what it says. So here's the deal. If someone, when you're doing righteousness, speaks evil of you, the blessing of having a good conscience is, is that it will make them, verse 16, to be ashamed because they're falsely accusing your good conversation, your good manner of life in Christ. They're falsely accusing you. And I think that many of us maybe, uh, to some degree or another, have had to face that. If you've lived for the Lord Jesus for very long, someone has criticized you for living for the Lord, and they've spoken evil of you, and later had to at least admit that what they said was wrong, that you are living a righteous and a clean life. Now here, watch this. The reason we kept reading, and the reason I read further in chapter number two is this. We're talking about conscience in these matters. And he's exhorting servants, regarding the masters, and then he's, regard, he's exhorting those of us who, who may suffer at some point for righteousness sake. But watch this. It's Jesus Christ who gives the example. Verse number 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So Jesus becomes the example. Now, watch, watch this again. And by the way, before we go on, go back to chapter 2 and uh, look at verse uh, number 20, um, 21. For here and two were you called because Christ also suffered. You see that? So when it came to servants, he's saying, listen, this is how I want you to live with a good conscience. And by the way, Christ suffered as a servant. And uh, he did no sin and no guile was found in his mouth. Think of that. He never one time said anything that was untoward. Not one time. And, and so he's given Christ as an example. Same thing here in chapter 3, verse number 18. Christ is the example of having suffered for sin and he suffered as the just one for those of us who are unjust, which is all of us. And so there's your example to follow. Now watch verse number 21. And, and notice the word conscience appearing here again in the application. He's talking about baptism in chapter 3, verses 19, 20, about, um, sorry, he's talking about the Lord uh, preaching to uh, those that were, uh, <clears throat> that perished. You know what? I need to just read it because I'm trying to go too quickly and now I'm not summarizing very well. Look at verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, right? This is Christ, which sometime were disobedient when once, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now watch. The like figure. It's a figure wherein to even baptism doth now doth also now save us. Very important parentheses here. Thank the Lord he put it in. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we get to verse number 21. He speaks of conscience again. And here's how I want you to link these together if you'll see the context. In, in one case, verse number 16, we have a good conscience as we suffer, suffer for doing right. In verse number 21, 
we have a good conscience toward God in baptism. And now here's what he's saying. Baptism does not and cannot wash away sin or save. Rather, it gives the person the satisfaction of knowing that they have served and obeyed God. And that's all baptism was meant to be. And that's what he's saying. You have your conscience clear because you know, I'm doing this for God. I'm doing it because of what God promised as a result of it. Baptism isn't going to put you in heaven. Baptism isn't going to wash away your sins. Baptism isn't going to help you help God like you more. That's not what it's about. It's about me saying, I want to have a clear conscience. And I want God to be pleased with me in my actions and in my conduct. Therefore, I'm submitting myself to it for His pleasure. And now I know in my heart and in my, in my soul that I've done all I can do to serve Him in that matter. That's exactly the type of application that we're looking at in verse number 16. That we're doing what we do for conscience sake. A clear conscience. Okay? Now, um, <clears throat> this is going to bring us into an inevitable passage in Romans chapter number 13. And I think it's better for us to just stop. And let's pick up Romans chapter 13 next time that we're together and work through that because this is going to then bring us into the matter of government directly and how we deal with government and what does the Bible say about these matters. And so I think that rather than trying too hard to race ahead and uh, really not having time to process all of the truth, let's just leave it. A little bit shorter Bible study tonight than we often have, but I'm sure uh, don't cheer too loud and don't smile too big and, and don't give each other high five. That would make me feel bad. I'm glad I'm not there to see it. My kids right now are laughing, thinking of high-fiving each other, I think. But uh, let's just leave it there tonight. And uh, that'll give you plenty of time to pray with your family or spend some time with the Lord on your own if that's what you're doing. All right, so we're wrapping that up then tonight with the matter of conscience. Servants and masters obeying, subjecting themselves to their, to their masters for conscience sake. And here suffering for righteousness sake for the sake of conscience all right suffering for righteousness for the sake of conscience being clear and uh, so i i'm laying the groundwork for then how we're going to apply this to what really is probably interesting most of us is how we're going to apply this to government father thank you then for the studies tonight for the truth of the bible thank you for the example of the lord jesus and thank you god again for speaking to us minister now, I pray the truth to those that are hearing, and I pray as we individually divide up and spend some time bringing some petitions, some cares, needs, some difficulties, some rejoicing, I pray that you would guide in all of that. And God, I pray that you help people not, not just to race through the prayer time tonight, but to be mindful and thoughtful and uh, that you would make it a sweet time of prayer and fellowship, we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. Good night.